Well, I've been uh, fortunate enough in my life to have had uh, two careers, but I don't have a click at work. Uh, and uh, the first uh, of those careers has been as an educationist, which is why I'm here with you today. But the second career has been as a professional mountain guide. And uh, this is a photograph of uh, myself and my eldest son on the top of the North Col of Mount Everest, uh, taken a few years ago now. Uh, the North Col of Everest is 7,100 meters, 23 and a half thousand feet. And uh, you may be asking, well, why am I starting a talk on curiosity and powerful learning against the backcloth of the North Col of Everest? Well, for a couple of reasons. The first is to demonstrate to you that I'm a really neat and cool sort of a guy. Uh, but seriously, the real reason I was guiding on Everest uh, at that time was because of this young man here, Paul Sillitoe. Paul is a service user with McIntyre Care, uh, which is the country's largest charity for those with a mental disability. What, uh, and Paul uh, lives and works uh, inside the charity, but what sets him aside from his colleagues is his obsession for mountaineering. And I've been uh, privileged over the years to guide uh, Paul and uh, some of his friends to uh, a large number of the world's great, great mountains. On one of those trips, uh, Paul ex expressed his sort of uh, fixation about Mount Everest. And I didn't think it was quite possible to actually get Paul to the summit of Everest because the acclimatization takes so, so long. But I did feel that actually climbing to the North Col of Everest, which is nowadays regarded as being a mountaineering objective in its own right, and was of course the sort of the gateway to the uh, er early British ascent of Everest, I did think that that was possible. And this is a photograph of Paul and myself just below the top uh, of the North Col. I talk quite a lot about Paul, as some of you know, because I believe it's at this point on the North Col of Everest that my two careers sort of come together. I talk about Paul because I want to demonstrate that under the right conditions, even somebody with a, with a disability like Paul's can do quite extraordinary things. And I believe this is what we do in education as well. Our moral purpose as educators is to create the conditions inside our schools and our system to enable every young person to reach their potential whatever their potential may be. Five years before I actually was on this ascent of Everest, I was appointed as the uh, Chief Advisor on School Standards to the, to the Secretary of State uh, in our government and became responsible in the early 2000s for the quality of education inside uh, the nation's schools. And those of you who are almost as old as I am will, will remember that we had a, a, a great deal of educational reform in, in the late 90s, where we accelerated the standards of literacy and numeracy in quite a spectacular fashion amongst a generation, a, a generation of, young, of, of young people, which is just now beginning to, to work through into our system. But when I took over responsibility, I was cons although I was excited about the rise in standards, I was concerned about the way in which we were achieving this, because it was very much a top-down reform, uh, very heavily target-driven. And I was beginning to be concerned as to whether, although we were raising academic standards, were we building learning capability into the lives of our young people. And so I began to, sh in concert with ministers like Estelle Morris and David Miliband, we began to shape, reshape uh, the educational policy agenda. We put a focus on the personalization of learning, where we would continue to raise standards, but also increase the learning capability of our young people as well. And some of you will remember the policy document, Excellence and Enjoyment, and there's a clue in that term uh, that, we've, that we produced in, at that time to sort of generate uh, these high levels of personalization in the learning of our young people. So it seems to me that as, as educators, we have uh, three goals, and we've heard a lot about those already to, today, that uh, we, should, we need to help our students acquire youthful, useful and important areas of knowledge. We, help them, we, we need to help them become powerful learners by expanding and making articulate their repertoire of learning skills. And by that token, we need to help them become fine 
caring and principled citizens. The question is, how do we go about achieving that? And I don't think we do it through sort of didactic environments uh, like this, uh, like, like this uh, painting of the classroom of the University of Bologna in 1350. Although my worry, as I spend increasing amounts of time in, in our nation's classrooms and those around the world, they don't look an awful lot different from what you're seeing in Bologna in, 13, in 1350. Sir Ken Robinson, in his uh, very famous TED talk, uh, spoke about the same themes. I'd just like to sort of share a little extract from that talk by Ken with you now. The second uh, principle that drives human life and flourishing is curiosity. If you can light the spark of curiosity in a child, they will learn without any further assistance from it. Children are natural learners. It's a real uh, achievement to put that particular ability out or to stand it. Um, curiosity is the kind of engine of achievement. Now, the reason I say this is because uh, one of the effects of the current culture here, if I can say so, has been to deprofessionalize teachers. There is no system in the world or any school in the country that's better than its teachers. Teachers are the lifeblood of the success of schools. But teaching is a creative profession. Teaching properly conceived is not a delivery system. You know, you're not there just to pass on received information. Great teachers do that. But what great teachers also do is mentor, stimulate, provoke, engage. You see, in the end, education is about learning. The role of a teacher is to facilitate learning. That's it. And part of the problem is, I think, that the culture of uh, the dominant culture of education has come to focus on not teaching and learning, but testing. Now, testing is important. Standardized tests have a place. But they should not be the dominant culture of education. They should be diagnostic. They should help. For me, there are two really sort of powerful implications from what uh, Ken was saying there. The first is that really high-performing educational systems focus relentlessly on the quality of teaching inside their classrooms and, and, and to try to reduce the variability between classrooms. The focus is, is on action inside the school or rather than the structural changes that our system seems to be bedeviled with. And the second implication that I draw from what Ken was saying is that our goal as educators is to try to build powerful learners. My three goals are on the top of the slide, and the, underneath that are the types of learning skills I believe that we have a responsibility to induct our students into and to help them acquire. And through, through doing that, they become curious and powerful learners. So it seems to me that curiosity, which is the metaphor I am using for powerful learning and which we've heard quite a bit about already today, curiosity really matters. And all of the research evidence suggests that curiosity is fundamental to academic success, to job performance, to relationships, to life satisfaction, to problem solving. And more recently, we've been hearing about research which says that it contributes to longevity as well. The question that faces us <laughs> is, how do we do this? Do we actually believe with Einstein that actually curiosity is a delicate little plant which, aside from stimulation, stands mainly in need of freedom? I would like to believe that was true. And in some contexts, I think it is. But in a lot of the schools that I work with in this country, in this city, and around the world, we have to adopt a different, a different tack. If we want our students to be curious, we have to teach them. But the question is, how do we do that?
I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, <laughs> I, wish I wish I had time to play it again. Uh, I'd like to take a few minutes, if I may, to explain to you how I am, in my own work, attempting to achieve this goal of enabling our students to become curious and powerful learners. And uh, I'm doing this through the use of an approach to professional learning amongst teachers, which I call instructional rounds. It's based upon the medical model of, of, uh, of training, which actually happens inside the hospital, and by the sort of the professor the, uh, asking two questions. Diagnosis, what is wrong with this pa patient? And, and treatment, how do we make them better? And I've been conducting these instructional rounds here in Bolton uh, over the last uh, few months with actually quite, quite impressive results. Let me give you an example of what we were doing in Easter Academy just, just before Easter. The Academy invited two dozen teachers or head teachers from other schools in the city to, uh, to join in on the round. And they asked for the volunteers, six volunteers from the staff, to open their classrooms open to, to visitation by the round members. The only instruction that I gave to that group of observers uh, in the morning before the observation was that I will not allow or permit any evaluation, any judgment of an, of, of an individual teacher. We are here to describe the practice inside the school and its impact upon student learning. Description, 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 no evaluation, no judgment. And that was very difficult for a lot of our colleagues. And so we went off on our rounds and we went, spent about 15 to 20 minutes in each classroom taking down descriptive data. And if you can think about it, we, at the end of the morning, we had 24 people, six classrooms, there's 144 individual pieces of data on the practice in ESA Academy. And that afternoon, I took them through a pretty rigorous inductive analytic process to try and make sense collectively of the data that we, that we had gathered. The aim was not to say how good teacher A or teacher B was, but what is the presenting practice in the, in the school. Once we had actually achieved uh, agreement and unanimity on an observation. I would summarize it, I would return it to the group, and then I would try and translate that into a theory of action statement, a hypothesis that described the impact upon teaching on the learning of the students in the, in the school. When a teacher does X, then students do Y. When teachers consistently ask higher order questions, then students are more engaged and begin to develop their own curriculum knowledge. When I began doing this uh, about six years ago, now in Melbourne, uh, again, the, 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 the reception was highly enthusiastic. People were saying to me, David, I really, I'm beginning to understand now what's actually going on inside our classrooms, because I would normally use a checklist, right? And that was the same reaction I had from colleagues in the academy uh, uh, last month. So what I did in the early days was I began then to synthesize all of those, uh, all of those uh, theories of action that I was beginning to generate. And what was interesting for me was that the more of these I did, and I did them in Australia, in London, in Chile, in Beijing, the more I did, the less I began to learn. Because it was the same types of things coming out time and time again. So I thought, perhaps we're onto something here. If we can synthesize these, that perhaps we've got a sort of a sense of what actually genuine practice looks like inside, class, inside classrooms. And the same things were coming out, irrespective of whether in a primary school, a secondary school, an FE college, or a special school, the same types of constructs were beginning to emerge. And there you see them on the screen now. I began to take them back to the teachers I originally worked with. They said, David, yes, those are what we were seeing. Right? Sorry, th those are the constructs rather than the th theories of action. They'll come up in a moment. But they said to me, the teachers, well, dear David, yes, some of these things I have control of as a teacher. Others I don't. And so I began <coughs> to realize there were some theories of action which related to the whole school and some to the teacher. 
Then some old cynic said to me, David, don't get too excited about this. This is only the work of teachers. And that really, really riled me. And so I went to my colleague and friend, John Hattie, who some of you will know, or his work you will know. Uh, he wrote a book called Visible Learning, which is, now has a global reach. And in that book, uh, John uh, began, to, he's a research scientist, began to analyze about 80 different teaching behaviors and try to calculate its impact upon learning using the concept of, of effect size. So how far can we push the normal curve of distribution toward, toward the right? And so John collaborated with me, and we used his research to actually calibrate the impact of these theories of, of, these theories of action. So here are the four theories of action about the whole school. The first is to pri prioritize high expectations. Most schools I go into nowadays have authentic relationships, but not always high expectations. Are we generating a curriculum which is based upon inquiry rather than didacticism? Thirdly, do we have protocols about how we teach, how we ask higher order questions, how we formulate groups which are consistently ap applied across the school? And do we have a language about learning that we are consistently using to actually help and induct our students into? into? Do we have a set of articulated learning protocols? The effect sizes of these are quite interesting. The first three are around about 0.4, which will give you about nine percentile points of, of, of increase in terms of, the norm, in terms of the normal curve. The one on learning, that it more directly affects students, is much higher, around about 0.7, which will give you 15 percentile points. And then we come to the theories of action for the teacher. Do we harness learning intentions? Do we build a narrative for the lesson and connect that to success criteria at, at the end? Are we setting to our students challenging tasks in their zones of proximal development, at that margin between existing knowledge and new knowledge? Are we asking a range of questions with an emphasis on higher order intellectual thinking? Are we, are we giving the appropriate feedback? We've heard a lot about that today as well. Are we using assessment for learning techniques where students assess each other against explicit criteria? And are we using cooperative groups to capture those metacognitive moments where students can deconstruct what we're saying in, in whole class situations and try to make, and try to make sense of, of them. It seems to me that this is a very powerful way of generating knowledge of effective practice from the practice of teachers. And uh, as I come to a close, I want to try to emphasize and that if you look down at these sort of principles of learning, you can, see that, you can see that they are directly affected and directly generated by the theories of action that we're using. And by that token, collectively, we are enhancing the, the level of curiosity and creativity that, that our students uh, are actually utilizing and acquiring. So for example, um, we can, when we use learning intentions, we're helping students to link prior to new knowledge. When we, are, uh, when we are using challenging tasks, we are accelerating the cognitive development of our youngsters. When we, um, when we are uh, uh, using uh, learning protocols, we're providing the scaffolding for learner autonomy. And so what I'm trying to, to, to in, in summary, what I'm trying to say is that we can teach curiosity. We can, can teach creativity by creating these powerful learning uh, conditions for our students, much as I did with Paul on Everest. The really important point, though, is that these theories of action are not given to you by some sort of aging, superannuated professor or some political master. These theories of action have been generated inductively from the powerful practice of thousands of teachers, around, fortunately around the world, but now increasingly here at Bolton. So in conclusion, I just would like to share with you this sort of definition of learning experiences that I wrote with uh, one of my mentors, Bruce Joyce, some time ago. Learning experiences are composed of content, process, and social climate. 
As teachers, we create for and with our students opportunities to explore and build important areas of knowledge. Explore and build. Develop powerful tools for their own learning and to live in humanizing social conditions. Thank you.